Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? What is up? Good Mike Work Commentaries back at you with episode 452. I am your host, Greg Morgan. Wow, we have got some shit to talk about tonight. I'm up here to give you your Raw and SmackDown reviews for August 28th and 29th. Obviously, I'm going to focus a lot of this commentary on the huge segment between Roman Reigns and John Cena that took place on Monday Night Raw, so stay tuned for that. I can assure you I will talk in depth about that subject here in just a little bit. In addition to that, I'll probably give some early predictions and maybe preview the next pay-per-view from the Raw brand, which is No Mercy. Two enormous matches are already booked for that show, as we all know. Next SmackDown pay-per-view, I believe, is Hell in the Cell. We'll probably talk a little bit about that, too. But overall, I found Raw a much better show this week. A lot more newsworthy and notable things took place on Raw. So we'll spend a lot of time on Raw, and we'll probably just touch on SmackDown a little bit. But before I get into those two shows, I do want to give you guys some brief comments. You guys have been begging me to give comments on the big Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor fight that took place last Saturday night. A lot of you wanted me to come up and make a video about that, but there was no way I was going to be able to pull that off. The best I was going to be able to do is give you some thoughts on that in my next commentary, so I figured that I would open up this episode with some thoughts on the big fight. Now, I have made no secret of my feelings about both guys. I hate them both. I honestly do. I think they're both colossal douchebags. Uh, Mayweather abuses women, for fuck's sake. And Conor McGregor is just that cocky, arrogant asshole that I hate. Months ago, when I gave LeVar Ball a bunch of shit for being this way, a lot of fans disagreed with me. And I'm sure that a lot of fans are going to disagree with me on my feelings on Conor McGregor. I just think the guy is a dick, a flat-out dick. To me, it blows my mind. And I've said this before. I said it about LeVar Ball. It blows my mind that people admire and look up to people with attitudes like that or celebrities with attitudes like that. I can't imagine, it kind of sounds funny saying this, I can't imagine anybody succeeding in life with that attitude, but at the same time, Conor McGregor got a $100 million payday on Saturday night, so I think it's pretty safe to say that he has succeeded in life. But being that type of person, that salty, shit-talking douche, I could never be like that, and I could never admire anybody like that. So in my mind, I didn't care who won this fight. If it was up to me, these two fuckheads would kill each other. And the last fucking thing in the world I was going to do is contribute to their bank account and buy this shit on pay-per-view. And as much as I cannot stand Conor McGregor, as much as I think he is an arrogant fuckface, I got to give him credit. I mean, he's not a boxer. This was his boxing debut. And in his boxing debut, he's stepping into the ring with arguably the greatest of all time. That's pretty fucking ballsy. And not only did he hold his own, you know, he came close a couple of times to knocking Floyd out. He, he, he landed a couple of shots. I mean, everybody was picking Floyd Mayweather. He was the obvious choice here. It cracked me up how many people were trying to give me boxing lessons on Twitter. Oh, good mic work. Conor McGregor's not a fighter, and he's going into the ring. He's going to get eaten alive by Floyd Mayweather. And I'm like, no shit. Who the fuck is debating this? Why the hell are you telling me this? I'm not fucking stupid. You think if I'm going to put money down, on this fight that I'm going to pick Conor McGregor? I don't think so. He's not supposed to win this fight. He's not going to win this fight. There's no way he can win this fight. Just like if Mayweather got into the octagon, there's no way he would win that fight. So Conor McGregor had nothing to lose and everything to gain. And that's why I thought that Conor was so smart for pursuing this fight because he knew not only was it going to be an enormous payday, easily the biggest one of his career, UFC could never pay him this kind of money. But not only is he going to get hundreds of millions of dollars for this, he's not going to lose face at all because no matter what happens to him, whether he gets beat or not or how badly he gets beat, he's got a built-in excuse that he is not a boxer. That is not his trained profession. And he can go out there after the fight and say, yeah, I lost, but if Mayweather gets into the octagon with me, he's going to lose. So really, the guy had nothing to lose. And imagine if he won. Imagine if McGregor would have been able to catch Floyd with a quick one, knock him out, upset Floyd Mayweather, shock the world, and beat this guy, making him 49-1. and Imagine the legendary status that that would launch Conor McGregor to. 
So the guy literally had nothing to lose. And he took it seriously. He trained his ass off, and he got in the ring, and he lasted 10 rounds. That's pretty impressive. And I was talking with my friends a couple of days before the fight, and they were all kind of saying, oh, Floyd's going to knock him out in one round or two rounds or something like that. And, and I was the one saying that I didn't think that was going to happen because Floyd doesn't knock out his opponents. He wins the majority of his fights by decision. And McGregor is 12 years younger than Floyd, probably a little bit stronger, and he's also a fighter that is trained to strike hard and knock people out. If he catches Floyd with one, he could shock the world. But I did not see Floyd knocking out McGregor. I was even the one that called a TKO. If this thing does go the distance, you know Mayweather is going to win hands down. But it could be a TKO situation to where Mayweather is just unloading on McGregor and he can't do anything and the referee jumps in and stops it. And that's exactly what happened in the 10th round. McGregor looked gassed, he looked completely fatigued, and Mayweather was just eating him for lunch. And then the referee finally jumped in and stopped it. A lot of people were saying that the fight was fixed and all this. Boxing is so fucking corrupt and so full of, of crap and garbage, but I don't think this show was fixed. I think it was a better fighter winning, is what it appeared to me. And I can say that because I'm unbiased. I hate both of these guys equally. I might hate Mayweather maybe even a little bit more than Connor, but they're both assholes in my book, so I can look at this objectively without any favorite favoritism at all whatsoever and Floyd Mayweather completely outboxed Conor McGregor but Conor did a great job by hanging in there as long as he did and he deserves a lot of credit for that and after the fight it was all about love I saw Floyd's press conference and McGregor came out and they kind of fist bumped each other put each other over talked about what great fighters they were there was a lot of trash talking at first and the weigh-in was a complete fucking circus but I thought it was really cool the way they came together at the end and kind of celebrated the two of them you know, winning so much money. I mean, Floyd got, what, $300 million? McGregor got $100 million? Something ridiculous like that. I wouldn't care if I got my ass knocked out either. I'd be happy as hell. McGregor's out there drinking scotch or something and, and having a good time, and he partied his balls off later on that night. So it was a great overall night, even in defeat for Conor McGregor, because he wasn't humiliated. Yes, he was beat. Yes, he was outboxed. But he wasn't humiliated. And uh, if anything, Mayweather should be ashamed that he didn't knock this guy out or beat him quicker than he did. So... I guess it was a great night for combat sports, great night for boxing, and a huge payday, and uh, every eyeball in the world was on that fight on Saturday night, and that's saying something. So it was a definitely big-time money fight between two huge personalities. Big props to Mauro Ronaldo for doing a great job calling that fight. How cool was that? A sporting event that really felt as big as the Super Bowl. Everybody was talking about this fight. And for a WWE announcer to call that fight was pretty awesome. And The Rock voiced the intro to the whole thing. So we had UFC, we had boxing, and we had WWE fingerprints all over this big fight. And that was a lot of fun. So uh, congrats to Mayweather. He's 50-0. and 0. I believe he will officially retire now. No reason to come back. He's 50-0. and 0. What a perfect number to retire. So I think we've seen Floyd box for the last time. And I'm glad that they were able to put this fight together. Because even though it was one guy who had never had a professional boxing match before, it was still a huge payday and, and shattered uh, pay-per-view numbers. I can only imagine. I have not seen any pay-per-view numbers. I have no idea uh, what kind of money they did there. But I can only assume that it was pretty fucking huge. I'm sure every bar in America was carrying that fight. And bars got to pay like two or 3000 bucks to carry those pay-per-view events. So it was a, a pretty big night for boxing and a pretty big night for UFC and Dana White and, and everybody involved there. So uh, at the end of the day, I might think that both guys are pieces of shit. But I got to give Floyd credit for being 50-0. and 0, And arguably, record-wise, he could be considered the greatest fighter ever. I know there was a lot of fights he didn't have and a lot of guys he may or may not have ducked. I don't know. I don't follow boxing that closely. I know that Floyd's not perfect, but he's unfucking defeated and he's 50 and 0. And McGregor, same thing. You know, a guy steps into a boxing ring with a guy that's uh, considered the greatest of all time and hangs with him for 10 rounds. Both guys deserve credit and uh, both guys earn their money, I guess. So anyway, that's my thoughts on the Mayweather-McGregor fight. Moving on now to Monday Night Raw. As much as I want to start with the John Cena and Roman Reigns promo, why don't we go in order of Monday Night Raw? Because there was a couple of other noteworthy things that took place on the show. With SmackDown, I'm probably going to bounce around a lot. But Raw will go right in order here. The show opened up with The Miz and The Miz Taraj in the ring about to cut a promo. The Miz does not get one word out of his mouth. And Kurt Angle interrupts and comes out to the stage and announces that he's making a 15-man battle royal to take place right there. And the winner is going to get an Intercontinental title shot against The Miz. The Miz, of course, as we all know, has been pissed off that the Intercontinental title has not been featured more heavily 
WWE, and he's really mad about wrestling in front of nobody at SummerSlam, which is ridiculous when you think that the Hardy Boys and the Miz are out there wrestling literally in front of five people. It's fucking bullshit. So the Miz seemed legitimately pissed about that. And so Angle says, fine, if you want the Intercontinental title to get more uh, TV time, then we'll have a title match next week. And a 15-man battle royal is going to determine who you face. And there were some interesting combatants in this uh, battle royal. The first one was the Big Show. The Big Show came out there completely clean-shaven. He shaved that disgusting beard off of his face, but you know what? I like the disgusting beard. He does not look right completely clean-shaven. A lot of people said he looked like King Kong Bundy, and he did. He looked a lot like Bundy uh, with everything shaved off of his face like that. And he looked kind of creepy, to be honest with you. And what's up with his arm? A couple of weeks ago on Raw, they're slamming his arm inside of a, a steel shark cage door, and now he's out there like nothing's fucking wrong meanwhile ace orton has had a cast on his arm for 35 fucking years so it would have been nice if they would have at least had i don't know the big show's arm taped up or something some continuity come on guys jesus it was only two weeks ago that his arm was supposedly broken or severely damaged uh in that segment uh with the shark cage and now he's out there like nothing's wrong so that was kind of annoying uh we had gold dust in the match too i was really rooting hard for gold dust because we know that he's kind of on his way out it feels that way, and I would just love for him to get one more little run, maybe with the Intercontinental title. He even liked my tweet. I tweeted out that I was rooting for him in that match, and he hit it with a like. But of course, I knew he wasn't going to win, and he didn't. He wound up getting eliminated. Uh, some other notable eliminations. Finn Balor was in the match. I kind of thought he was one of the favorites to win this thing. Uh, but when he's in there doing his thing, uh, after a brief club reunion, he did hook up with Gallows and Anderson briefly. I forgot who they tossed out of the ring. But Balor is in there kicking ass. The lights go out. They come back on. Wyatt is standing behind Finn Balor and tosses him out. And then the lights go out again. They come back on and Wyatt is gone. So the issue between Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt will continue here. I guess that was a good way to get Balor eliminated from the match without having to do it legit or clean, quote-unquote. It was also funny to see all the guys team up on Kurt Hawkins and throw him out. I got a kick out of that. And a really nice finishing sequence. We had Jason Jordan in the ring with the Miz, Taraj, and Jeff Hardy. And I'm thinking, well, Jordan's probably going to get the victory here. He winds up dumping out Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel simultaneously. And Jeff Hardy immediately right after that runs up behind Jordan and dumps him out. And Jeff Hardy actually wins this battle royal. That's a bit of a surprise there. And I'm not sure what the WWE's thinking on this is. Jeff Hardy has always been their guy. WWE has always preferred Jeff over Matt. And if nothing is going to be resolved with this broken Hardy's gimmick, I don't think WWE has a lot of interest in Matt. I would love for Matt to get an opportunity. I think he can be great even without that intellectual property of the Broken Hardys. I still think he can do some of his shit. He's already doing it, you know, with the funny language and his facial expressions and all of that. I think they can do a version of the Broken character without going full broken, and it could probably still be over. But Jeff Hardy has always been WWE's guy. He's the most marketable of the two, at least when Matt's not doing the broken gimmick. And it looks like he's going to be getting another crack at the Intercontinental title. And maybe WWE feels that if nothing's going to be resolved with the broken gimmicks, they need to start moving forward with the Hardys because they're not young anymore. And if they want to do anything with them, they should probably do it now. So if WWE has any plans for a Jeff Hardy singles run, maybe this is the beginning of that. The match is going to take place next week on Raw. I don't know who to predict there. I don't know if WWE will put the title on Jeff Hardy or not. I don't think that they would, but maybe they will. I don't know. Maybe they want to have a title change at No Mercy. Maybe Hardy beats The Miz next week for the title, and then The Miz regains at No Mercy or something like that. Uh, maybe one of the Hardy boys turns on the other. I have no idea where this is going to lead. It might not lead anywhere. It might just be a one-time, one-week deal to have a big title match on a Raw for the fans to tune into. And uh, maybe it's a test, too, to see if Jeff Hardy can draw ratings. You know, Vince in WWE probably has fond memories of when Jeff Hardy was so over in the company before. So maybe this is a little test to see if the fans will tune in to watch his title matches. And then if they do, he'll have more opportunities in the future. I have no idea. So I don't know who's going to win next week. Don't really care. If Hardy wins, great. If Miz wins, great. Don't care. But I will say that Jeff Hardy winning that battle royal was a little bit surprising. Uh, we had Enzo winning a cruiserweight match. He beat Noam Dar. Of course, he showed up on 205 Live last week. He's officially a part of the cruiserweight brand now. But that doesn't mean we're not going to get him on Raw, which is funny because I briefly forgot about that. When Enzo showed up on 205 Live, in my head, I said to myself, oh, good, we don't have to see this fucker on Raw anymore. But yes, we will, because the cruiserweights work on Raw. I had damn near forgotten that. And Enzo's back out there on Raw doing his thing. Has a match with Noam Dar. I guess they're positioning him to face Neville 
for the cruiserweight title. Neville was looking on on the monitor from backstage, and that's ridiculous. Enzo better not defeat Neville for that cruiserweight title, or I will shit a brick. By the way, I am just a little bit under the weather this week, so if my voice sounds a little bit off, it's because my throat kind of hurts a little bit, and I've been coughing a lot, so that's just a little heads up there. Next segment, we had Paul Heyman cutting a promo with Brock Lesnar. Brock was on the show again. I'm surprised Brock was on Raw this week. This seemed like the perfect week for him to skip after what happened to him last week with Braun Strowman power slamming him straight to hell. You would think that Brock would take a week or two off and maybe show up on the Go Home No Mercy show and have one confrontation with Braun Strowman before the pay-per-view match, but but uh, Heyman and Brock came out there. Heyman cut his typical promo. Brock grabbed the mic away from Paul Heyman near the end of it and just says, Suplex City, bitch. And Braun Strowman never came out or anything. So uh, they burned a Brock appearance just uh, for that short promo there. And I'm pretty intrigued by that match. I mean, we saw it all come to a head last week with Brock Lesnar and Braun Strowman getting physical and Braun dominating Brock for the second night in a row. He kicked his ass at SummerSlam, then he kicked his ass on Monday Night Raw, and we have the match set for No Mercy, and I am excited as fuck about it. And right now, I would love to see Braun Strowman get that title. I think it would be really surprising if Brock went out there and beat Braun Strowman just like he did to Samoa Joe at Great Balls of Fire. I think it's a little bit too early to predict it yet. I mean, these two matches, this match with Strowman and Brock and Roman and Cena, this could have been SummerSlam. This is what they should have done at SummerSlam, but instead, they're waiting to do it at no mercy. Maybe it's just because of the venue. I've mentioned LA a bunch of times. That's a big arena, a big setting for some of these big matches, and no mercy could turn out to be pay-per-view of the year if these matches come through the way everybody's hoping they are. But when you look at the landscape and everything going on with the title situation and the top contenders on Raw, who do you put over in this match? Do you have Strowman win and carry the belt for the rest of the year? I would love to see that. I wanted Braun Strowman to win at SummerSlam. So if he's able to find a way to beat Brock Lesnar, win the title, maybe Brock goes away for a few months, comes back Survivor Series or comes back Royal Rumble and starts building for his WrestleMania program. I don't know. It would definitely be cool to see the Universal title back on Raw and actually being defended on Raw from time to time and being featured on the show every week instead of every few weeks. So on one hand, I'm really rooting for Strowman hard, but at the same time Brock you know he's still my guy I still love Brock I know a lot of fans are growing tired of him and his one move set with the German suplexes and all of that but I still think Brock is a big money draw and uh, I would be fine if he retained the title as well so this is legitimately a situation where I think the fans should not worry too much about who should win or who deserves to win or any of that shit. Really, in this match, nothing matters. I want everybody to pick their favorite guy and root for that guy. And I've wanted Strowman to win the title for a long time, but if I'm looking at this in storyline, I kind of am rooting for Brock. I kind of want Brock to, you know, silence the monster among men. But if he does that, then everybody's going to think that Strowman was buried, and I don't even want to fucking listen to that shit. So I'm hoping that for once... Because of the epicness of this match and that both guys are over and respected by the majority of the wrestling audience for once. Let's not be fantasy bookers here. Let's not pass judgment on who WWE should or should not put over in this match. Let's watch it. Let's enjoy it. Let's hope it's good and cheer on your favorite. Let's pretend it's an actual fucking wrestling match for once. Why don't we act like real wrestling fans for a change and instead of questioning everything and criticizing WWE's booking decisions, let's fucking enjoy this match just once that's all i ask just once let's enjoy it and let's not complain about whoever wins or loses because i feel truly in this match it really doesn't matter i mean braun Strowman losing to brock lesnar is nothing to be ashamed of he can still be a monster they can still have a return match and the same goes for Brock Lesnar. Him losing to Strowman doesn't bury him either. Strowman, you know, survived what Roman Reigns tried to do to him at Great Balls of Fire. Strowman can do anything. So I'm looking forward to watching this epic main event match take place at Staples Center. I want to see what's going to happen. And I'm not going to care too much what happens. I just want to see what will happen. You know what I mean? So I'm hoping that the fans can just, you know, put a sock in it for this one fucking match and stop being so goddamn critical just for once and enjoy the epicness that this match could possibly give us at No Mercy. It could be a stinker. It very well could, but I don't think so. Given what we've seen from Braun Strowman, what he's capable of, and we all know what Brock Lesnar can do, he can really turn it up when he wants to. He might just throw German suplexes all day, but Brock can still sell. Brock is still believable, and Brock is still a badass. And I think it's going to be a really, really fun match. And I hope fans appreciate it for what it is, instead of picking apart the booking decisions. So that's my opinion there. 
Uh, Sheamus and Cesaro are still feuding with Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. They had a pair of one-on-one matches. Cesaro defeated Sheamus with an uppercut and kind of a roll-up when uh, Cesaro and Dean Ambrose were getting involved outside of the ring. We then had an impromptu Sheamus and Dean Ambrose match, which Ambrose won with the Dirty Deeds. So nothing really new there. These two teams obviously are probably going to wrestle for the tag team titles at No Mercy. We had a one-on-one match between Emma and Mickie James. This was set up in a backstage segment earlier on. And Emma is back there being all flaky and talking about how many times she's been trending on Twitter and that she was the one that started the women's revolution. And Mickey James kind of laughs her off or whatever. They go out there later on and have their match. Emma actually scores an upset victory over Mickey James. And then after the match, she grabs the microphone. And, and as she's leaving the ring, going up the ramp, she's yelling, I started the women's revolution. I started the women's revolution over and over and over and over again. And this was kind of funny, but it got a lot of fans talking on Twitter that this could be setting up a page return. Because we all know that Paige was a huge part of that women's revolution when they started calling up girls from NXT. She was one of the very first ones, or she might have been the first one, and she showed up and beat AJ Lee for the title. And that's when things started taking a turn for the women. So with Emma bragging that she was the one that started this, uh, this could really be a perfect way to set up Paige, and it looks pretty likely. She has been cleared to return to the ring from what I understand. I don't know what kind of heat she has with WWE management right now. I know that it's not good. I know that the relationship with her and WWE is strained because she acts like a complete idiot outside of the ring with her moron boyfriend or fiancé, Alberto Del Rio, and the two of them consistently embarrass themselves on a regular basis. And WWE, I think, is extremely fed up with Paige. So why they're going to bring her back and push her, I have no idea. So maybe they're just bringing Paige back because they're paying her and they might as well use her and do something with her until her contract's up. Or maybe they want to help Paige out. Maybe they're reaching out a helping hand to Paige. Hey, come back to the company. Let us push you and give you something meaningful to do. And maybe it can help turn your mess of a life around. But she's still with Alberto and he's on horrible terms with WWE. So the whole thing is just kind of weird and awkward. Probably about as weird as and awkward as it was when CM Punk left WWE and AJ Lee was left behind. You know, that relationship had to be odd to say the least. So it's kind of a similar situation here with Paige and Alberto. But yeah, I agree with everybody that says this seems like they're setting up a Paige return here and uh, maybe we'll see her next week. Who knows? We had an excruciatingly horrible segment between Elias Sampson and Jerry Lawler. Now, Jerry Lawler was on Raw doing commentary because Booker T, who lives in Houston, was at home with his family riding out Hurricane Harvey. And everybody that's been affected by this hurricane, you have my well wishes and my utmost sympathy. I did donate a few bucks to the Red Cross As a longtime native of the beaches of North Carolina, I have been through many hurricanes and I have been through many floods. And that shit is no joke. Uh, There was one flood that I went through in 1999, Hurricane Floyd. It did a lot of the same shit that Harvey did. It came up, made landfall, kind of stopped and held there, and then kind of drifted back. And because of that long time over one area, it dumped a shit ton of rain. And the town that I was living in was completely underwater. I was living in an apartment building, and I was on the second floor, and the entire first floor was flooded. And I was stuck up in my apartment for about four days, eating granola bars and drinking Gatorade with no power. The only thing I had was my phone. The phone lines were actually still working. And uh, a battery-powered radio, and that was it. I was up there for like four days just eating snacks, and it sucked. Finally, the water in the river started receding, and people were able to get out of there. Luckily, I moved my car out of the way. I had a friend that lived about a mile away and lived way up on a hill, and he's like, you know what? I think we're going to get some flooding. Why don't you move your car up here and walk home? And that's what I did. So I was stuck up in my apartment for all that time, but everybody below me and everybody in the parking lot lost their cars. You look out the window, and all you see is little car antennas sticking up out of the water. It was fucking crazy. One of the scariest natural disasters I've ever been through. So I can sympathize with people going through hurricanes and going through floods and it's horrible and it's heartbreaking and it displaces so many millions of people. And uh, the people of Houston and a lot of people are in Texas are affected by this. Millions of them have been affected by this flood and this hurricane. And it's really sad to see people going through that. So I hope Booker T and his family are okay. I hope they survived the flood. And I hope there was not too much damage uh, as far as Booker T's life goes. But uh, I know that a lot of other people weren't so lucky. So uh, good luck to everybody dealing with that. Uh, The horrible segment that I was alluding to had to do with Pelvis Wesley. Uh, They're in Memphis, of course. Uh, for Monday Night Raw, and Lawler is a Memphis legend, which is probably why they brought him out for commentary. And the Drifter is singing his song, shitting on Memphis, and Lawler interrupts him on the mic, 
and then brings out Heath Slater, who's dressed up as the Southpaw regional wrestling character, Pelvis Wesley, and this completely mortified me. Come on, WWE, please do not ruin Southpaw wrestling. It's one of the only things we have going for us <laughs> as wrestling fans, and to be able to go on your YouTube channel and watch that fucking hilarious brilliance is one of the best things about wrestling. Do not bring that into a segment on Monday Night Raw and fuck it up. And that's what they did. So hopefully that will be the last Southpaw wrestling character we see on WWE television. They do not need to do that. Now we're on to the big elephant in the room. Now we're on to the big news of the week. The epic promo, the contract signing between John Cena and Roman Reigns. Now I had said last week when this whole thing kicked off that I was not getting that big fight feel out of this that I thought we were going to get. I thought Roman and Cena would feel a lot bigger. The fans even seemed like they didn't care last week. And I mentioned that in my last commentary, that, oh man, maybe No Mercy is a better place for this match because, shit, the fans don't seem to care at all. They seem to hate both guys. Well, I think that changed after this past week's Monday Night Raw because holy, holy, holy shit, was that a crazy promo. They shot hard on each other. You know, I don't even know where to begin. This shit was so good. I wish I was Kurt Angle. He was sitting there right in the middle of it. Watching Kurt Angle react to what these two guys were saying was priceless. I mean, his jaw was dropping. His eyes were wide open. He was even laughing at times. And it was a great promo between both guys. Now, there's been a lot of controversy about this. A lot of people are bitching. Can you believe that? I've actually received tweets from people complaining that John Cena buried Roman Reigns. What fucking universe am I living on? You mean to tell me after the entire world has been shitting on the face of Roman Reigns for the past two and a half, three years, they're all of a sudden mad that he's being buried? This should be the greatest day of your life. What the fuck are you talking about? And John Cena did the typical John Cena thing. Now, I thought this promo was so good because I wanted them to shoot on each other. It needed to be real. It needed to feel real because you have two big guys, big stars in the company that have huge egos and they really need to get personal with each other for this feud to work. But they more than exceeded expectations. I didn't think that they were going to go this far. We have seen things like this from John Cena before. He's cut promos like this with The Rock. He's cut promos like this even as recently as this year with The Miz. John Cena does know how to shoot, and John Cena does know how to get personal. And he did this with Roman Reigns. He has that, that John Cena way of whenever his opponent is making their retort, he just laughs them off and makes those goofy-ass facial expressions. One thing that's always bothered me about John Cena is that he never seems to take anything seriously and he just laughs off what everybody says and that is annoying as hell. And I would love for him to come up against somebody that is as good as he is on the mic and he's run into those people a couple of times before, namely The Rock, namely The Miz, but Roman could not hang with John Cena. I mean, John Cena, say what you want about him. Not only can he get a good match out of just about anybody on the roster, this fucker can cut a promo. He's always been able to. I've maintained that since day one. And damn, was John Cena giving it to Roman Reigns, talking about how John Cena is just a part-timer, but the reason he's still around is because Roman Reigns can't do his job. Roman Reigns was supposed to take the torch from John Cena and move forward, but John Cena is still here, and WWE still keeps bringing him back because Roman Reigns can't handle this situation and the position that he's in. Calls him a corporately created Cena bootleg who will never fill his shoes. And uh, he says that, yeah, you brag about beating The Undertaker, but he's just a beat-up veteran with a bad hip. I cannot believe that John Cena said that about The Undertaker. But with that being said, even though I was shocked at that line, and I was a little bit offended by that line, to be honest with you, John Cena's not wrong. What did John Cena say there that we as fans haven't said? How many times in my commentaries prior to WrestleMania was I saying the same shit about The Undertaker? All of you were saying it too. We were all saying that The Undertaker is too old, he's too beat up, it's sad to see him in the ring at this state of his career, and he needs to retire. So what John Cena said was not wrong. And I don't really think he buried The Undertaker. I mean, what he said about The Undertaker is something that we've all known and we've all said before. But that doesn't make it any less shocking. I was a little bit pissed that John Cena said that about The Undertaker because I'm like, okay, me as a fan, I can say that. But you can't say that on Monday Night Raw, John. So uh, I kind of liked it and I kind of didn't like it all at the same time, but that was a pretty jaw-dropping line there by John Cena. He was even using industry terms. He was talking about turning heel and he wasn't doing it in a joking matter like he did a few years ago when he turned his foot and then he goes, there you go, there's my heel turn. You know, he was saying it legit that some of the fans want me to turn heel. Some of the fans want you to turn heel. The only thing that John Cena did not bring up 
And I'm surprised that he didn't because I was waiting for it. I thought for sure that John Cena would mention the wellness violation that Roman had last year because we all know John Cena is squeaky clean. This guy has never gotten a parking ticket to the best of my knowledge. And Roman Reigns having that uh, wellness violation last year and them stripping the title off of him and having him job a couple of times and punishing him is something that I thought John Cena would bring up. I mean, he sort of did. He talked about the U.S. title and that when he held the U.S. title, he wanted to bring that title up. He wanted to help that belt gain more notoriety and he took it seriously and he had the U.S. Open Challenge and all of that when Roman Reigns held it he took it as a punishment he didn't take it seriously and he was an asshole and some of that might be true about Roman Reigns so all of the things that John Cena said about Roman I was like wow he is just undressing this guy in front of everybody and for all the people that say Roman Reigns is just shoved down our throats not to the level that John Cena was I'm sorry John Cena was never punished John Cena never lost five weeks in a row on Monday Night Raw to one guy or lost three pay-per-view matches in a row. John Cena never had long hair. John Cena never wore all black. John Cena was never a member of a three-man faction. There is a lot of differences between the two, and I've maintained for the past year or so now that Roman Reigns is not what the fans think. It's just fun to boo him because he's not that great on the mic, and the fans love to give him shit, and they need that new guy. I think even the Cena haters were getting tired of hating on Cena after a while so they need something new Roman Reigns is who they've zeroed in on and no matter how many times WWE has him lose the next time he wins a match it turns right into oh he's burying everybody and they're shoving him down our throats again you know no matter how many times he gets beat you know he's not allowed to win if he if he wins one time then all of a sudden he's John Cena 2.0 with a big golden shovel so I've always thought that the fans lacked a lot of logic in the Roman Reigns thinking. I agree with a lot of what they say. I agree that he's not good on the mic and he can be at times boring, especially when he speaks. But just like Cena, Roman Reigns can work and he can work good matches and he's had plenty of good matches with plenty of good guys. You can't shit on him for his ring work. The guy busts his ass and at the end of the year, I've mentioned this last week, at the end of the year, when they're doing the year-end awards, Roman Reigns is going to win feud of the year with Braun Strowman because that was amazing shit. And if Roman Reigns really was John Cena 2.0, do you think they would let anybody go out in that ring and bury him on the mic the way John Cena did? I mean, holy shit. Now, in Roman's defense, he wasn't all bad. He definitely could not hang with John Cena on the mic, but he wasn't horrible. There was one time where he lost his train of thought and Cena jumped right on him and he said, hey, it's called a promo, son. If you want to be a big star in this business, you're going to have to learn how to cut one or something like that. I mean, that was a crazy line. I mean, my fucking jaw dropped to the floor when Cena said that. But other than that, Roman Reigns kind of stood up to Cena and said that he's not as good as he thinks he is and that he's just a yes man and he's a part-time and fake bitch and talks about how he just buries young talent with his big shovel and all that crap. So it's not like Roman Reigns just sat there and ate a bunch of shit, but really Cena got the better of that promo. And when I'm looking at this match, much like the... Uh, the Brock Lesnar and Braun Strowman match, I want to pick my favorite here. I want to root for who I think should win this match. And so far in storyline, after seeing what John Cena did to Roman Reigns, I want Roman to beat him. I want Roman to beat John Cena at no mercy. That's what I hope happens. And this is really a battle of who the fans hate the least. And much like years ago, this reminds me of 2006, when the fans were all up the ass of Triple H for like two years prior to this. The reign of terror and all the horrible shit that he did when he was in evolution and holding people back and not wanting to work with guys. He gets in the ring with John Cena at WrestleMania 22 and the fans completely turn on Cena and they're cheering for Triple H, the very same guy that they were complaining about, you know, a year or two before, saying that he holds people down. But now John Cena started getting all those victories, and that was pissing them off, so they moved their hate to somebody else. This is the same fucking shit. I bet you in L.A., the majority of the fans are going to be cheering for John Cena in this match with Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns is the new guy to hate, and the fans just want to hate him. No matter what WWE does, whether Roman Reigns wins or loses matches, fans are going to hate him regardless. So I think the crowd involvement and the crowd interaction for this match at No Mercy is going to be off the fucking hook. I cannot wait to hear the crowd battle each other. You know, Cena sucks, Roman sucks, go Cena, go Roman. Maybe they'll be booing both of them, I don't know. But if I had to guess and make an early prediction, I would think the fans would be mostly on John Cena's side here. But I'm actually rooting for Roman Reigns. I've had Roman Reigns' back for a long time, even though, like I've said time and time again before you guys go and dislike this video, I'm not saying I don't 
understand your complaints about Roman Reigns. I just think the complaints are a little bit over the top and a little bit exaggerated, and the guy is not nearly as bad as you're making him out to be, especially when you watch his work in the ring. And at the end of the day, I think this match can be a lot of fun. I'm really surprised they're having this match at No Mercy instead of at SummerSlam. But remember years ago, what year was it? 2010? It was right before Batista left. Uh, I think it was 09. They did the match at SummerSlam between Batista and Cena. And Batista won. And then they had the return at WrestleMania 26. Am I right about that? Are my years right? They might not be. And then Cena won the return. I think he even won the world title in that match. So maybe this is just the first match between the two. Whoever goes over here will lose in the return. And because of all of the heat and all of the nasty things that were said in this promo, maybe, just maybe, we will see a heel turn of some kind. What if leading up to No Mercy, John Cena and Roman Reigns get a tag team title shot against Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. Imagine that. What if that happens on the Go Home No Mercy show? Cena Roman versus Dean and Seth for the titles. And what if Roman turns and the Shield reunites and fucks Cena's shit up? I hate it when they put two baby faces that are feuding together in tag team matches together. They did this back in the day with Austin and Michaels winning the tag team belts. And I think Austin and Undertaker even won the tag belts before their big SummerSlam main event back in 98. So this is a very common thing that they do. And it really pissed me off that Gallows and Anderson interrupted this promo at the end. I don't know if WWE expected this promo to be as good as it was because they did not need to do the tag team match with Roman Reigns and John Cena defeating Gallows and Anderson. They weren't really getting along in the match. I caught Roman Reigns laughing a couple of times when John Cena was getting beaten up, but the end saw Roman Reigns spear Anderson, I believe, and get the pin, and that was that. So a great segment between John Cena and Roman Reigns ended with an extremely unnecessary tag team match that I didn't think they needed to do at all. But uh, bravo to Cena and Roman for really adding a lot of interest to this match because I was skeptical after last week when they first started going in that direction with John Cena showing up on Raw and calling out Roman Reigns it wasn't getting the oohs and ahs from the crowd that I thought it was going to get and they really changed direction on Raw with that great segment and I tweeted out during the segment that that could possibly be a career trajectory changing segment for Roman Reigns that might be just what he needs it might turn out to be nothing it might not affect Roman Reigns in any way, shape, or form at all. But maybe WWE did this and designed this promo to try to get Roman Reigns some sympathy because I did mention a lot of people were tweeting me, can you believe that John Cena buried Roman Reigns? And I was shocked the fans even cared about that. So maybe WWE is trying to get Roman some sympathy. I mean, everybody hates John Cena. They hate the way he buries everybody, not only in the ring, but on the mic. And so if he goes out there and does that to Roman Reigns, maybe that's what the fans need to finally care a little bit more about Roman Reigns and maybe actually cheer him on at no mercy. I think I'm going to be one of the only people cheering on Roman Reigns in this match with John Cena. I want Roman to win, but I'm probably in the minority on that, and I think the crowd in L.A., will be the same way, but an extremely fun promo and one that got the internet talking a lot. I thought it was a lot of fun. To me, there's nothing to argue about here. There should be nobody in the comments below bitching about what either guy did or bitching about my comments or my thoughts or, oh, you're just defending this guy or that guy. It's not about that. I actually enjoyed this promo for what it was. I thought it was fun, and I think the match is going to be fun. For once, we can talk about John Cena and Roman Reigns without having to debate each other until we're blue in the face about who does what or who does deserves what or any of that fucking nonsense that has been making my ears bleed for the past seven years. I think these two big matches at No Mercy, Strowman Brock and Cena Roman can be a lot of fun if the fans can just fucking learn to enjoy them. So let's hope that happens. But I would love to hear all of your opinions, uh, what you thought of this promo and who you think is going to go over in the match. Uh, like I said, there's no need to argue any of my points here. Uh, there was really nothing argue worthy, but I would definitely like to hear what you guys think of this whole situation and what WWE might do in this big match between these two guys. And that wasn't the only big news we saw on Monday Night Raw. The main event was for the women's title. Of course, this match was set up last week with Alexa Bliss invoking her rematch clause against Sasha Banks to take place on Monday Night Raw. And Alexa Bliss beat her clean and won back the Raw women's title. That really surprised me. She beat her with a DDT and uh, wins the title. And the ending was kind of silly because, goddamn, you saw it coming from three and a half miles away. Nia Jax comes out there to celebrate, quote-unquote, after Alexa Bliss's victory and uh, she even beats up Sasha Banks to kind of throw the fans off but we all knew you guys had to know that she was going to turn on Alexa 
and then she ends up lifting Alexa Bliss up on her shoulders, and it immediately reminded me of Randy Orton when he won the title from Chris Benoit, and I think it was the next night on Raw when Batista had him up on his shoulders, and then Triple H gave the big thumbs down and Batista dropped him. That's exactly what Nia Jax did to Alexa Bliss. Turns on her, drops her off of her shoulders, and picks up the women's title and stands over her. So it looks like they're going to move on to Nia Jax versus Alexa Bliss. I don't know what the point of putting the belt on Sasha Banks was at SummerSlam. The only thing I can think of is they just wanted to have a whole bunch of title changes on the show. But WWE has done a hell of a lot of hot potatoing with both women's titles titles here in the last year or so so congrats to alexa bliss she's once again champ what does that make her like three-time champ that's crazy and i guess she'll be facing uh nia Jax at no mercy and then whatever they do with sasha from here that's anybody's guess a lot of people have been calling for a heel turn for sasha for a long time i guess that could be on the horizon maybe they'll wait until bailey gets healthy and comes back to do that but it's a shame that poor Sasha has yet another extremely short women's title reign in the WWE. Let's move on to SmackDown Live here before I completely lose my voice. I'm going to kind of bounce around here, but uh, the show opened up, I believe, with a Jinder Mahal segment. He's out there with the Singh brothers. They are out there apologizing profusely for letting him down last week by getting beat by Shinsuke in that handicap match, I believe. And they even bend over and get down to kiss his feet. And right before they're about to kiss his feet, Shinsuke interrupts and shows up. He gets in Jinder Mahal's face and then is attacked by all three of them. Randy Orton comes out to make the save and help out Shinsuke. And then Rusev hits the ring after that, nails Randy Orton with a kick, and Rusev and Jinder Mahal stand tall to end the segment. That was the main event tag team match between Shinsuke Nakamura and Randy Orton versus Jinder Mahal and Rusev. Shinsuke and Randy won the main event, and after the match, Randy Orton nailed Shinsuke Nakamura with an RKO because it was announced that next week on SmackDown, there's going to be a one-on-one -on -one match between Shinsuke and Randy Orton to determine the new number one contender for Jinder Mahal's title. So that should be a fun match. I mean, Shinsuke, one week he's in there with John Cena in a number one contenders match. The next week he's in there with Randy Orton. So he could be beating both of these guys here. And it seems likely that he will. Randy Orton has had countless title matches against Jinder Mahal. That feud actually feels like it's run its course. I can't imagine them wrestling again or being put in the hell in the cell or whatever because they already did the Punjabi prison match. So Shinsuke seems like the likely guy to come out of next week victorious. And that's pretty cool for Shinsuke. I mean, he's beating John Cena and Randy Orton on television within a matter of weeks. So hopefully that match will live up to the hype and we'll see a good one next week in the main event of SmackDown. As far as what else we saw on SmackDown, we had a Kevin Owens promo. He's really pissed off at Shane McMahon. They're setting up their inevitable match and program here probably at the next pay-per-view. Shane McMahon comes out. The two of them have a little back and forth, and Shane makes the match that I think Owens interrupted or something like that. I wasn't really paying attention, but Shane has Aiden English take on Sami Zayn in a one-on-one -on -one match. Kevin Owens sticks around for commentary for this match, and he's getting annoyed with the referee. Eventually, he jumps off headset, gets in the ring, takes the referee shirt off of the referee and puts it on, and decides that he is now the referee for that match and ends up jumping in and hitting Sami Zayn with a pop-up powerbomb and fast counting Sami, giving Aiden English the win. And I guess that's Owens' way of saying, hey, Shane, if you can jump in the ring and be a referee, then I can too. AJ Styles was also on the show. He was cutting a promo and reinstating the U.S. Open Challenge. Ty Dillinger comes out to answer it, but Baron Corbin interrupts him and says no way. Uh, Ty Dillinger shoves him back, and then Baron Corbin attacks him as he's getting in the ring, beats the hell out of him. Ty Dillinger sticks around and still wants to have the match anyway. He eventually succumbs and taps out to the calf crusher, and that's a match I would actually like to see again. I would like to see a fresh Dillinger versus a fresh AJ and have them go like 15-20 minutes on SmackDown. I think that would be an awesome match. And Corbin, of course, attacks Ty Dillinger after the match as well. And AJ Styles ends up running off Corbin with a forearm and knocks him out of the ring. So it looks like Corbin will be next in line to get a shot at AJ Styles' United States title. So maybe he can bounce back here. All that unfortunate shit that went down with him with the Money in the Bank briefcase... You know, who knows what really happened there, if it was all of his trash talking on Twitter or whether or not WWE just lost faith in him, who knows. Whatever the case is, it looks like he's being dropped down a notch and he's going to be working for the U.S. belt now and maybe he'll wind up winning it, who knows. We had Shelton Benjamin making his in-ring return to WWE. Of course, we saw him last week. He was, he was introduced as Chad Gable's new partner and they're just replacing Jordan with Shelton Benjamin, I guess. And him and Gable had their first outing as a tag team together against the Ascension. Of course, they won that match. But, you know, there's more here than meets the eye, I think. I think it's pretty obvious that Shelton is going to wind up turning 
on Gable, even right in the beginning of the match. You saw uh, Benjamin gets tagged in, and Gable is like holding one of the Ascension guys for a double team move. And Benjamin kind of looks at him like, What are you doing? and just shoves him out of the way and takes over the match from there. So it looks like right off the bat, these two guys are not completely in sync. Uh, that will probably escalate and boil over a little bit, and eventually we'll probably have a match between the two. It's really good to see Shelton back in WWE. He looks great. If either one of these two guys is going to turn on the other, I would assume it would be Shelton Benjamin turning on Gable. I think uh, Gable turning heel would be a little strange, especially since Shelton is a much bigger guy than Gable. You know, for Gable to work heel in that situation would be a little bit odd. So, you know, I think the writing is on the wall there. Eventually, these two guys are going to have some sort of a split or breakup. And uh, I've mentioned week after week after week that I would not be surprised at all if these two guys somehow find a way to get involved in the Jason Jordan storyline on Monday Night Raw. You know at some point we're going to have to get to Chad Gable versus Jason Jordan. I don't know how they're going to make that happen. Perhaps Survivor Series at the next joint pay-per-view. These two guys will probably be on opposite sides of a team or something like that. And uh, maybe that can lead to a one-on-one interpromotional match in the future. Or maybe they can move Gable to Raw or some shit. I have no idea. But it seems pretty obvious that his alliance with Shelton Benjamin is probably going to be short-lived. Bobby Roode was back on TV this week. We saw him debut last week and defeat Aiden English in a one-on-one match. Same thing this week. This time he's defeating Mike Kanellis in a one-on-one match. And it looks like they're really going to start building and pushing Bobby Roode as a top babyface on SmackDown because John Cena's gone, so they need to fill that void somehow. And I'm hoping Bobby Roode will be in the world title picture once his push gets rolling here. And as far as Mike Kanellis goes, I don't know what to make of this guy. You know, I'm really surprised that they brought Mike and Maria up to the main roster without sending them to NXT first. I think that would have been a much better idea because the fans aren't into this gimmick. And WWE, maybe because of Maria's past history with the company, they didn't want to have her in NXT. They thought that she should belong on the main roster because a lot of the fans remember her. But still, you should test this shit out in NXT and work out the kinks. And if you see problems, you can tweak the gimmick a little bit or you can change some things up. Doing this on SmackDown just seems like they don't know what the hell they're doing with these two. And I think it's already over for Mike Kanellis. I mean, before he even got started in WWE. So I don't know where they're going to go in the future with these two. Eventually, you would think that Mike would break off from Maria and say, I want to be called Mike Bennett again. So who knows what they're going to do there. But I think it was a big mistake to bring them up to SmackDown without testing them out in NXT first and uh, perfecting the angle and perfecting the gimmick a little bit more uh, before they're on TV every single week. We also had a tag team match between the Usos and the New Day. The winner of this match was going to be allowed to pick the stipulation in their next title match. The Usos did get the victory. I don't know when this title match is going to happen, if it's going to happen on SmackDown or if it's going to happen at Hell in the Cell. If they wait that long until Hell in the Cell, that might be a fun match. Usos versus the New Day, all the great matches we've already seen them have. If they throw all of these guys in the cell, I think they could make some magic together. I think a Hell in the Cell match between these two teams would be a lot of fucking fun. But chances are this match will probably take place on SmackDown. We also saw Tamina beat like a local jobber. It looks like Lana is kind of acting as Tamina's manager now, trying to set her on a championship path. Uh, she even had all sorts of attention after the victory with the cameramen and all that crap. Uh, apparently Lana is the cause of all that. So who knows what they're doing there. I really don't care. We did not see a Dolph Ziggler return either. All we saw was a backstage promo just like last week. Last week he was teasing that he was going to come back as a new character or maybe debut a new look or something like that. And he said because they were in Little Rock, Arkansas, that that crowd doesn't deserve to see that. So we're going to have to wait and see it next week. And uh, he talks about the, the sequin jackets and the sparkles and the music and the lighting treatments and all of that. And it made me wonder, do you think he would come back as Shawn Michaels? What if he shows up next week on SmackDown and you hear Shawn Michaels' music play, the sexy boy theme, and Dolph comes out there dressed exactly like Shawn Michaels, wearing his old gear, dancing around, doing all the Shawn Michaels stuff, and maybe that's his reason. Say, hey, the only way I'm going to get a chance and the only way the fans are going to care about me is if I act like this guy or something like that. Who knows? He's always drawn comparisons with Shawn Michaels. He's teasing all of these flashy outfits and all this shit that all these other guys do. Maybe he just shows up as a knockoff Shawn Michaels, just like they did fake Diesel and fake Razor Ramon. Only this time, it might actually be fucking funny. Other than that, I don't really know what Dolph Ziggler can really do. He did cut a pretty good promo in that backstage interview, talking about how he's bust his ass for years and years, and he's the best one in the company, and nobody can wrestle like him, and he never gets his opportunities, and he's pissed off about it, and blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, maybe he just uh, debuts a crazy look, and maybe it's a throwback to Shawn Michaels. Who the fuck knows? 
what they're going to do there. I did read that Dolph Ziggler's brother was actually sentenced to 15 years in prison for involuntary manslaughter. Apparently him and one of his friends tried to rob a drug dealer or something like that, and it went awry, and the drug dealer fought back. He wound up getting shot and killed, but neither guy will admit to pulling the trigger, so they gave uh, Dolph's brother 15 years. I think the other guy got 17. So that's got to be pretty tough on Dolph. I couldn't imagine having a family member that did something like that you know, what do you do? I mean, I know you have to continue to love them and support them, but they're also a murderer. So, you know, what does that do to you emotionally? So, you know, I hope Dolph is doing okay with that whole situation because that sounds pretty fucked up. But I guess whatever he winds up doing next week on SmackDown, we'll find out in seven days. So that pretty much does it for your Raw and SmackDown. I really feel like I got to get out of here now. My voice is going Hopefully this will not sound too bad and I will not sound too raspy, but I can definitely tell something's off with my voice. So I'm going to go ahead and quit now while I'm ahead. And uh, just a little programming note for you guys as well. I want to give a shout out to uh, Aaron Rift, uh, owner of NoDQ.com. They invited me on to do a guest appearance on one of their panel videos. And it should be up on their YouTube channel in the next week or so. Once it is, I'll tweet a link to it. Uh, but check out NoDQ or Aaron Rift's uh, YouTube channel in the future and you can see me make a guest appearance on there. It was a lot of fun. We talked for about an hour on the best finishes in matches in wrestling history. It was a really cool subject and a really cool topic to discuss with uh, three other dudes and it was a lot of fun. So keep a lookout for that in the future. I should be up here regular time next week with episode 453 and I'm sure we will have a lot more to talk about as it relates to John Cena and Roman Reigns and No Mercy and everything going on on Raw and SmackDown. So you guys have a great rest of your week, and I'll talk to you in just a few days. Until next time, peace.